All right, Rich Casova alongside Dwayne Hart back in the studio for another round of Cybersecurity Mindset and the podcast. This this dude's all in in cybersecurity. So if that's in your wheelhouse uh, of interest to you, your business, company, what have you, or any organization, um, if cybersecurity has been um, and should be front of mind, this is the man. He actually wears the cybersecurity uh, uh, hacker's hat and and the um, the branding. That's Dwayne Hart. So he's joining us once again. He is the author um, of a best-selling book. He has a YouTube channel that's gone viral, if you will, and uh, he's now back in the studio for the episode of the Cybersecurity Mindset uh, podcast. Um, Dwayne, welcome back to the studio. Well, thank you for having me here, Rich, as always. Did you know that... I put a brand new theme to everything that I do. I have labeled it as Cyber Talk. Oh, okay. Cyber Talk because here's a little history. When I was a child, the only thing I used to do was talk a lot. Me, me too. Yeah. <laughs> and I still talk. <laughs> right. But I like cybersecurity. Yeah. So I theme things that I do in my conversation with cybersecurity as Cyber Talk. Okay. And I think that it works well for me. Yeah. Now, trust me, I don't speak cybersecurity when I go to bed at night. <laughs> right. But but it's one of those topics that, um, you know, whether you're a business or a consumer or are using technology today, it permeates throughout all those conversations. Right. And so um, let's get right into it. So our, our first we're going to uh, have two episodes here for you today. We're going to uh, record the first one right now. We're talking about cyber insurance and um impacting on business and really compelling to me is the healthcare ramifications. But let's talk about Dwayne, why does this matter? Well, here's the reason why cyber insurance matters. And it's a simple process. About 50 years ago, we did not have issues with all of these cyber attacks, right? Corporations was not losing money. Data was really of not so much importance. Right. So, when all of those transition to an area of being important, there needs to be some type of founded foundation in place to go and make sure that business loss and all your consumers and all your healthcare professional and your patient medical records are protected. But also, too, we need to hold organizations accountable. So the purpose of having that insurance is to make organizations realize that you have to take cybersecurity um, serious because because there are some downstream liability that comes behind a cyber attack. Somebody is held responsible. Typically, when a bank gets robbed, no one really looks at the downstream liability. Right. right? You know, most of the criminals, they don't even have to go back and pay for the door that they busted down <laughs> right. at the bank. Yeah. But we're in a different world now with yeah. cybersecurity, so it matters a lot. Because there's there's a lot of losses that are occurring, and these losses are with the federal government, it's with uh, individuals, it's with health care corporations, because they can easily be sued. Right. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned um, decades ago, uh, we were more concerned about the padlock on the front door or the lock to the filing cabinet where all those confidential records are being held. Now it's the Internet padlock, right? Yes. Yes, it is the internet backlog um, because hackers like to invoke into digital destruction. Right. All right. So, so when we think of cybersecurity, like people have to think of cybersecurity as this shield. Right. And this shield around their life, and then on the inside of that shield, it's it's pretty much your healthcare information, any type of privacy data that you have, and so forth. So, what cybersecurity does. It's to serve as that protective ring and to try to protect that data. But right. it's times that hackers find a way to break the bubble, and then that's when the downstream liability comes to surface. Somebody has to pay the cost. Right, and you mentioned banking or bank robbery. You can go back to the old Western, you know, movies, you know, uh -huh. and seeing the train robberies or the bank robberies. But and and at that time, it was whoever controlled and designed the vault that held all the precious possessions, you know, whether it's money or any financial um, objects of, of worth. And it was, again, the digital code or the, co the code on that, on that lock, right, to the safe. And if you didn't have the code to that lock, you weren't getting in, right? 
And now um, you don't have to travel to the bank or travel to the hospital or travel to that business down the street. You can literally just plug into the internet. And if you're not protected, if you don't have those just beyond firewalls, right, you have to have uh, another level of security. Um, And that's what we're talking about today, cybersecurity. So um, we've talked about uh, banks, which would be the whole financial sector, right? And you, you know, you can talk about Wall Street, stocks, investments, um, so forth, right? And so we've talked about a lot of topics on this podcast in, in the past about cryptocurrency, about credit card scams. Uh, but this is, this is compelling when we talk about hospitals, in particular healthcare, right? Because now we're not just dealing with, you know, numbers and digits and recovering some money or recovering, like you said, that broken door on the bank. We're literally, I mean, not to be uh, too dramatic, but it, it, it could come down to literally life and death. Right. If the systems that are running the healthcare that are um, providing treatment, uh, health um, uh, treatment that is going to determine that person's outcome, whether it's some type of um, uh, you know medicine or the actual surgery, the procedure, so much like everything else in life, so much is permeated by technology, and now in the hospitals. And if that's interrupted, disrupted, what yeah. happens? Yes, because. Things like smart pills are being built. You know, let's just let's just go back because you made an interesting uh, statement about the different type of medical devices that right. you have. So if we focus on the product designers, which is the corporations that make these products, they are supposed to quality test these products. Right. And imagine if, you know, there's a surgery right. and the product do not operate. Right. Because with a laptop, if it doesn't operate, well, you just take it back to Best Buy. Right, right, right yeah. yeah but it's a not medical, life or death. Yes. But a medical device is pretty much attached to human life. Right. So if it doesn't operate, then the product designer is held liable. This is how downstream liability operates right. when it comes to the healthcare sectors. Now, in the middle of that, what you have is doctors and the hospitals, so the downstream liability goes down and individuals are thinking, who is responsible, right. the hospital, the doctor, or the product designer? And I would imagine that there's always an argument amongst those three right. you know, you know, to see who is held responsible because the product designer is saying that my product worked right. when, it when was I delivered. sent it over yeah, to yeah, you. Exactly, yeah. Right? So after that, that's when – the investigation happens and, you know, doctors are going to say that it didn't work. But see, I can go even deeper into that. Imagine if you was a contracting company that worked at a hospital. Right. And your job was to do the maintenance on those medical devices. Right. Another piece of downstream liability happening where you as a contracting company now can be held liable if your employees do not perform well and take care of those medical Equipment and follow that cyber protocol, right? Right. So, and if you think about the physician, that's an easy out for the physician in a sense, right? Because they went to medical school to learn how to um, do their craft of delivering healthcare. Right. They didn't go to school to learn IT, right? And so, and now we have not just teletherapy; we have telesurgery now. Yes. There's um, there's an interesting person we interviewed a while back. They're actually bringing it to the marketplace. It's in real time right now. That surgery can be. Um, uh, um, can take place in two different locations. Yes, all based on the internet. Right. And if you have a, a third party, that hacker, that uh, terrorist, that um, uh, cyber attacker that that inter- 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 interrupts that. We talked about um, security on on our motor vehicles now, with the smart vehicles and smart homes. Those can be interrupted or bypassed or attacked. And that can cause havoc and uh, uh, inconvenience and a hassle. But again, we're not talking about surgery procedures where people are, you know, under and you need that urgent uh, care, right? Yes. Yes, you need that. And and I'm just going to focus back again. When we look at this cyber insurance and we look at the downstream liability that actually occurs because... There's the product designer, there's the hospital, there is the doctor, there's there's the maintenance personnel 
for the contracting company that's supposed to do the maintenance on these devices because a lot of these devices should be going through a calibration period. And just imagine if someone did not do the calibration on that piece of equipment and then there's a surgery that is going on and right. it fails. Now the piece of liability falls down on who? Who does it fall on? Right? It's it does this is this is the type of world that we live in because I like to use that term downstream liability. Right. Because downstream liability is very important because because downstream liability takes into consideration of of like every component or every organization and every personnel that is involved with the situation. See, it's kind of like a set of dominoes, right? If I have six dominoes that are stacked up, and if I press that one domino, it causes the rest of the dominoes to fail. Right. But in the in the workplace, um, there's a term they call passing the buck, right? Right. <laughs> it's like um, shifting the blame. Exactly. Um, yeah. Speaking of shifting, real quick, uh, there was an interesting article um, by a professor at Rutgers University with this. Um, statement saying social I want you your thoughts on this social engineering attacks such as phishing remain one of the most effective ways to breach a hospital system and again to your point it's the workforce that remains the weakest link yes here, here, here goes here goes the idea especially about the workforce when we look at people people have to form as human firewalls yeah and I made that statement throughout my book in the cybersecurity mindset right Especially it's that hacker's of, hat. Yes. Right. Because the human firewall is stating that someone has a defensive mindset. Like you're the guardian. Like right. you're the one that's standing at the gate. If you see something wrong, you speak. Right. You try to prevent things from happening. So so when we look at different type of threat vectors, which is the which is which is the gateways that you can enter a system, humans are the weakest link. Now, why is Humans the weakest links. Humans are the weakest link because, because see, they have choices. Because see, they can be ethical or they can be non-ethical. When we look at technology, there's a standard. Humans themselves have an option not to follow standards, or they can just be inept or having a bad day. Just human error right. is is a right. real thing. Right, right, right. and it's with the that, best of intentions, right, right, and because of their level of awareness. Because because if I design a system to operate in a certain standard, it's going to follow that path. It's right. going to follow all specifications. Right. Humans can alter right. and do things in a way where they're not really understanding the impact right. of what goes on. So like this is why, why humans are the weakest link. So when we look at that concept and looking at the discussion here about cyber insurance, it really has to be taught to humans how important it is to maintain healthcare equipment, making sure you follow protocols, make sure that you do things the right way. Because a part of social engineering right. is that is that people talk a lot. All right. So right. so you imagine if a person was sitting in a bar and and if you have them talking, and then there's some private information that comes right, out. Yeah. Right. And then that private information can be used to carry out a sophisticated attack against a healthcare company or a hospital. Yeah. We've been talking, you know, medical and the, the, the uh, gaps in cyber protection order. Right. But you mentioned insurance. Let's pivot to that topic. Right. Which is, you know, the other side of the coin. Right. Cause you know, if things, if there's a, an opportunity for things to go bad, they it will. Murphy's Law, right? And so even with the best intentions, even with the best you know um, attempts and so forth, uh, whether it's a uh, lack of focus by an employee or just a, a break, a disconnect in the protection, something's going to, you know, you got to prepare for. I mean, you wouldn't drive your car without insurance, right? Um, so, but what's interesting is, um, really switching gears. We've been talking about the hospital, the individual, the workforce. Um, before we went on the air, we were talking about government and state uh, funded or state backed cyber attacks. Talk to us about that because Lloyd's of London made this um, rather um, amazing announcement that they're moving forward. They're going to require all insurance companies to exclude state backed 
cyber attacks. Talk about that. Well, well, you can't sue Russia. (laughs) (laughs) So let's be honest about that. Right. And and I believe that is the reason why, because when you have a nation sponsored cyber attack, you know, the nation themselves is sponsoring that. Yeah. You know, it's a geopolitical concern. Right. So as an individual, you cannot sue you can't a foreign that. nation. Right, right. In fact, if you did, well, you would not win. Yeah. So that's the reason why. Now, I don't know if this is in um, motion, but maybe the U.S. federal government can interject into a sort of some of the loss. Maybe, you know, maybe that's the case. But, But I think that when you have these sophisticated level of attacks that occur from like these nations, I think that when it comes to cyber insurance, it, it can be very expensive, even if a corporation could purchase cyber insurance. Right. right? Because, because with the level of attacks that are occurring today, especially in the healthcare sector, if you want insurance, you're going to pay more because the trends are saying that we are having more issues in cybersecurity. You know, it's kind of like having a car, right? Right. If you are involved with an accident every day, I'm pretty sure that your ins- <laughs> right. pretty sure that your insurance would go up, right? <laughs> right. Or they'll um, no longer allow you to uh, use that company. You have to go seek out another insurance company, right? Right. Right. Um, that, that's a good analogy. Now you mentioned um, where the government stands on this. In fact. Um, uh, the White House just last week released its first national c- cybersecurity strategy, which floated the idea of building a federal cyber insurance backstop to talk about, you know, to protect against exactly what you're talking about, massive loss to the economy in the wake, wake of fu- future um, cyber threats. And that is kind of state to state, uh, meaning state government, right? So if a government of a foreign country um, intercepts attacks, uh, which would be typically defined as a terrorist attack, right? It's pretty aggressive, right? For the actual state government to do something. Again, as an individual company, corporation, entity, you can't really pursue that. And so the White House is really, uh, and the federal government is kind of trying to catch up with these, you know, what used to be sci-fi scenarios, which are reality today. Yeah, so so here's my thought on this, and that I'm going to inject something that's in motion here now is that the U.S. government wants to hold a lot of companies um, accountable for for these cybersecurity attacks, right? So that's one one side. So you think about the other side where you have the U.S. government kind of wants to absorb some of the weight and the burden from these cyber attacks. So I look at that as a win-win. If you as a corporation follow the standards, the rules, the regulation, and do what you're supposed to do, and if you suffer a cyber attack, then we can assure some of your loss. Right. You know, this this is kind of what I see for the for the future. But likewise, and as I said before, is that it's a geopolitical concern. You know, the U.S. government do not even. Um, have a voice itself for to negotiate with a foreign nation. All right. But, but we know how that works. Right. <laughs> um, so circling back to healthcare and, and foreign governments um, earlier this year, it was pretty rather shocking that the, we talked about again, before going to the other pro Russian group, Killnet took credit for taking down portions of the systems of more than a dozen U S hospitals, including Stanford healthcare, Duke, uh, hospital in Cedar Sinai. So, again, a little bit different scenario. If uh, what we've heard a lot in the news is a domestic terrorist group, you know, um, U.S. based, and they will go after you know the local um, city government or some type of uh, government agency, and basically hold them hostage for money, right? So this isn't necessarily driven by that. Um, and then, how do you react, and how does it? Um, you know, what's the repercussions of, the, of that scenario? Well, the repercussion is probably probably no different than any other, any other organization when it comes to a financial loss. Right. Okay. So, so let's be straightforward with that. But, but I think that where it differs is that the type of attack and who's carrying it out. 
This is this is where this is where the situation separates here, because in a domestic environment, you know, like you can have cyber insurance if it's domestic, right? Right. And I think that you are gonna be protected, and you can have that cyber insurance. But at the but at the same time, I still think that organizations um, still are gonna suffer and still going to have some due loss because at the end of the day, it is about the data. It's about what is protected. And if there's a loss with that data and if things are not protected, that's when downstream liability happens. And that's when the shift of blame occurring. So, so it's really in a way I could say that it differs, but it's, you know, only different because it's a domestic type of type of concern. Right. So you can have that cyber insurance, but, but then again, what is the cost of this cyber insurance? Yeah. The trade off, right? Yes. Um, loss and liability versus investment um, and coverage. So, good uh, point to kind of just uh, mention. We've got about 10 more minutes, a lot of topics to cover here. Uh, Rich Casanova here in our global podcast studios here in Atlanta, Georgia. We're having a conversation with none other than Mr. Dwayne Hart. Uh, he's an author, consultant, speaker, um, YouTube. Uh, phenomenon, right? <laughs> a lot of, a lot of things happening on the YouTube channel for him. Uh, uh, maybe you want to touch on some of these, talk about your book, YouTube channel, um, also podcast, um, host right here in the studio. And, um, so for anything cybersecurity, anything, um, uh, related to what I just mentioned, check out, it's very simple to, to connect with uh, Mr. Hart. It's just DwayneHart.com. There you can find links to the podcast. Uh, you can order a copy of the book, um, all that good stuff. So on that, on that side, before we get back into the topic of cybersecurity, um, what's what's happening new in your world in terms of you becoming this media mogul, right? Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, we were talking earlier today on the phone about uh, uh, you have a panel coming up on the YouTube channel and uh, give us a little drop on that. We'll switch gears back to cybersecurity in a second. Well, uh, part of the transition for my YouTube channel was to focus on people that are making a difference in the industry. Okay. It could be anywhere anywhere from a person that is involved with a talent acquisition system, uh, work, workforce development, looking at government uh, contracting, and also to having panel discussions where I could get four, maybe five people that are from different areas of cybersecurity and, and to contribute to certain topics. One of the one of the topics that I am going to be focusing on is that, um, you know, I, I want to look at women, comp- women contribution to technology, past, present, and the future, which is going to focus on a discussion and just looking at some of the contributions that, that women have provided to cybersecurity. But I'm also learning that much of the guests is having fun because yeah. I have guests, guests that are so energetic if you are on YouTube and if you go type in the chief of cybersecurity, you'll you'll see some of my media and some of my videos. And I'm always looking for people that have some cyber talk that actually okay. want to come on go. and yeah. do some conversations. Sounds great. So, again, uh, all that can be found at DwayneHart.com. All right. So um, let's go back to these the challenges in terms of or, or maybe we've talked about the challenge a lot what mm-hmm. are some solutions what do you what do you see you know companies specifically you know health in the healthcare sector um you know what's some good news or some stop gaps that they're able to put into place to prevent some of these attacks well what i'm always looking for and it's you know i could come up with a list so i'm just gonna keep it straight forward okay. and i'm gonna get three here all right Number one is that as an organization, you need to understand your environment. Right. Okay? Hacks happen because people don't understand the environment because they don't understand their weaknesses. All right? right. One. Two is that part of part of your organization is to go and operate with a cyber protection strategy that fits your organization. I always like to use the word cyber protection because cybersecurity is is based on offense and defense standards. So you have to operate with both of those. Three is that that you never assume that you're talking too much about cybersecurity. 
Yeah. Because there's always that one person that does not understand certain practices and may not be aware of the decisions that they make. So you so you have to stay on on those three levels. And all of those are going to feed one of my motto is that you must sustain 360 degrees of cyber visibility. Right. So that means that you know what's on your enterprise, you understand the state of your cybersecurity programs, and you're always monitoring and looking for the weaknesses and those gaps. And and part of that is just to be vigilant. Right. And over in the cybersecurity mindset, this is about your situation awareness. Yeah. Hundred percent, and just like from a civilian standpoint, if you will, or a consumer, I think um, it's almost daily that um, anytime you know I've been doing online banking, like most people have been, right? And it seems like they're taking this a lot more seriously than they used to, right? Every time you log in, they um, they detect that you're uh, have traveled to a different you know, part that you're yes, not normal, where you're not normally located. They're tracking you, um, you know, GPS wise. Right. And they're also looking at the devices that you're using, which is, um, the reason I mentioned that because within, whether it's medical or, you know, you're selling cars or whatever, whatever your widget is, or in a podcast studio, um, it's, we talked about the workforce. It's the devices, right? That's, I mean, where is the, 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 I guess what I'm asking is, where is the most common point of entry for a cyber attack? Is it because of new devices coming online into the business or um, people downloading the wrong software or uh, passwords? We talked about passwords in the, in the past, which I think is very fascinating. They said, what was it, a, a, a six-digit password can be attacked within uh, three seconds as opposed to a 16 uh, configuration patchwork can take up to 3000 years. Right. So, um, so I guess it's a combination of education and, um, you talked about awareness, but where, where's the attack? Is there a typical attack that uh, people should be looking out for Okay, from device or from connection or. Okay. So, so we want to talk about a hacker sweet spot, right? Yeah, there you go. So it's like that piece of pie. All right. <laughs> What's on that hackers menu for today? Well, okay. I'll, based on based on the industry, based on the level of attacks that are occurring, it's it's commonly to go and look at software. Now, why why is software? Because software has a lot of code that that uh, can be susceptible to an attack. Now, I'm not just talking about local local software that you use on your desktop. It can be public public facing systems. You know, a public facing system. Is pretty much like a web page, or it's a system where the public can have access to uh, information for for an organization. So, so when you go to a web page, and like when you type information in, and say, for instance, you fill out a form, most of that is public facing data and public facing systems. Right now, at the back end of those public facing systems is what you have is databases. And databases right. can be susceptible to kind of being attacked, especially if, if it's a vulnerability that's set up an unsecured channel. And those unsecured channels are uh, where you have your different type of attacks, like a man-in-the-middle attacks, SQL injection, and so forth. So, so with software is the number one. Two is email, because you can send an attachment through email. Right. And if a user opens up a malicious attachment, then imagine what happens. Right. Those are those are at the top of the list that I would see, but but those are your gateways right. that normally normally happens. Now with passwords and so forth, it usually happens with password because hackers find way to um uh masquerade a channel. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> spoofing so they take over a channel. But 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 see, that usually happens because a person opens up a malicious attachment, right. and and then what happens is that hackers are usually able to take over the session. Right. Wow. Like, yeah. See, that's an attack. You call a session a session hijacking. So it's so it's kind of like like if like if you sending me some information now, and so we don't know that there's a 
hacker that's sitting on the side over here. Right. He just interject everything and takes <laughs> it over. And whatever, whatever you are trying to tell me, right, yeah. it seems legit. Right. Right. You go, hey, Dwayne, I like to go and eat at Fogo de Chow. Right. Right. You know, that is exactly what you send out. But but then once some session hijacking hacking or spoofing, where they completely turn the message around and it say something else to me, like, hey, can you give me the number to that credit card that's on my desk? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like that old game. I don't know if it's yeah. called Telephone Tag, whatever it was. You're like, you have 20 people on the road and you tell the story, you whisper in the ear, and by the time it gets to the end, it's a completely different yes. version of the yes. story. Or uh, I was also thinking about uh, thinking about a, a, a group in a room, a boardroom, whatever. It's It tends to be the loudest voice uh, kind of kind of dominate that conversation, right? And kind of take over or hack the uh, the the meeting, if you will, right? Um, so g- great points. Thanks for answering that question. Um, and on that note, we're going to wrap up this episode, but stay tuned. We got another hot episode coming up right after this. Um, if you're listening to the podcast, the next episode, we're going to be talking about cyber uh, maturity and cyber planning. Um, and again, uh, Rich Casanova here on behalf of Dwayne Hart. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode today. We appreciate you listening and um, stay tuned for our next one. Signing off for Rich Casanova here on behalf of Dwayne Hart and check out everything about cybersecurity. Just go to DwayneHart.com and we'll see you next time.